Welcome back to the Art of the Matter and our study of Exodus and the figure of Moses. I find it almost impossible to talk about Moses, who has been the focus of our readings in Exodus, without thinking of Michelangelo. One of Michelangelo's greatest sculptures, a sculpture that the master himself considered one of his finest works, is this statue of Moses. I'd like to say just a word about Michelangelo before we turn our attention to our Old Testament passage and this statue. St. Mary's is launching a sermon series this week entitled The God-Saturated Life, drawing on the book The Reservoir, published by Renovare. The chapter being focused on this week pertains to the importance of the incarnation, the goodness of creation, and the fact that God delights in matter, in stuff, in things and spirits being embodied. I can think of no greater artist to illustrate these themes than Michelangelo. Michelangelo could look at a block of marble and see a figure inside it. His job, he said, was to set that figure free. He once said, sculpting is easy. You just go down to the skin and stop. A consummate artist and creator himself he was fascinated by God's creation, and in it he saw the mark of the divine maker at every turn. So let's begin by acknowledging the goodness and the beauty of creation, and turn our attention to an artist whose appreciation of God's creation and whose intimate understanding of matter has never been surpassed. So returning to our statue of Moses, it's part of a larger monument, a funerary monument, commemorating Pope Julius II, whose statue lounges rather awkwardly just above Moses and just below the feet of the Virgin Mary. This monument was supposed to be built as a freestanding mausoleum inside of St. Peter's Basilica, which Julius II was planning to demolish and completely rebuild on a grandiose scale a scale big enough to comfortably house his tomb. Had the mausoleum been built according to Michelangelo's original design, its size would have been commensurate with Julius's ego, 34 feet wide and 50 feet high. It would have included more than 40 full-size marble sculptures, including a 10-foot high statue of Julius himself in full papal regalia and all the figures would have been embedded in a complicated three-tiered structure with pillars, arches, and niches. The statue of Moses, even seated, is almost eight feet high and appears, when you look at it straight on, as slightly disproportionate, with the torso seeming a bit too large for the rest of the body. That is because it was meant to be placed on the second tier of the tomb, and thus seen from below. These illustrations of the front and side elevations of the tomb give you some idea of what it would have looked like as a freestanding monument in St. Peter's, with the red stars indicating where the statue of Moses would have been placed. Clearly, Michelangelo's original plan was never realized, and the story of this tomb which was to be the crowning achievement of Michelangelo's career, became known among early art historians as the tragedy of the tomb. Just like Moses, doomed to wander 40 years in the wilderness with the Israelites and never allowed to cross over into the promised land, Michelangelo would be engaged in work on this tomb for 40 years on and off from 1505 until 1545, and when it was finished, it wasn't housed inside of St. Peter's at all, but in a much smaller, humbler church in Rome, San Pietro in Vincoli, St. Peter in Chains. And in fact, Julius's body isn't even buried there, so it doesn't really qualify as a tomb. 
By the way, the two female figures on either side of Moses are Jacob's wives, Rachel on the left and Leah on the right. Rachel standing for the contemplative life, Leah for a life of action. They too were carved by Michelangelo, but without the same love and attention he showed in carving Moses. In earlier readings in Exodus, we've heard how the Israelites complained and grumbled to Moses. There isn't any water. We want meat. We're sick of this manna. We don't want to follow Moses and Aaron around anymore. We want to go back to Egypt. That's the background. In today's reading, in chapter 20, God transmit to Moses the Ten Commandments that Israel is to follow as part of the covenant relationship they are entering into with the Lord. First and foremost are these words, I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself an idol, whether in the form of anything that is heaven above, or that is on the earth beneath, or that is in the water under the earth. This is the most important thing that the Israelites have to learn. They must not put anything or anybody in the place of God, and they must not make and worship idols. The Lord goes on to enumerate all the other commandments, and then we hear of the reaction of the Israelites in verses 18 and 19. When all the people witnessed the thunder and lightning, the sound of the trumpet, and the mountain smoking, they were afraid and trembled and stood at a distance, and said to Moses, You speak to us, and we will listen. But do not let God speak to us, or we will die. And they're right to be afraid, because their natural tendency, as we will see next week, is to rebel against God. And they sensed that the consequences of doing that would be terrible. So they say to Moses, you speak to us and we will listen. But they never do. Again and again, they defy Moses and Aaron, and several times are even on the verge of stoning them to death. They try the patience of God to the point where he's ready to wipe them out and start all over again, with Moses being the only survivor. Yet Moses intercedes for them, pleads with the Lord not to wipe out his covenant people, and God relents. This becomes a constant refrain. In a portion of scripture that we don't read, it's in the book of Numbers, God has Moses send 12 of the Israelites, one from each tribe, into the promised land to scout it out for 40 days and bring back a report. When the 12 return, 10 give a negative report of their findings. Yes, they said, the land is flowing with milk and honey, but the people who live there are huge and powerful, living in big cities that are well fortified. Trying to drive these people out of the land will be impossible. Two scouts, however, brought back glowing reports, and they were eager to lay claim to this bountiful territory. This is Nicolas Poussin's image of the two scouts discovering the promised land. As you can see, it takes two men to hoist and carry just one bunch of grapes grown in this abundant, fruitful soil. But the assembled people decide to listen to the ten who were negative and fearful. They're too frightened to enter this land of promise. And the Lord is so angry, he is again on the verge of wiping them out entirely. But Moses begs God to spare them. The Lord relents, but vows that this entire generation, excluding the two spies who brought back a good report, will never enter the promised land. They would wander for 40 years in the wilderness and Moses with them. The red dot on the map indicates roughly the area of the Israelites wandering in the Sinai Peninsula. 
You might ask why our friend Moses was not allowed to enter the promised land. And that would be a good question. After almost 40 years of wandering in the wilderness, the Israelites came to the desert of Zin. Once again, there is no water. And the people, of course, turn on Moses and Aaron. There's no water to drink. Why did you bring us to this terrible place? Was it just to watch us die? Moses and Aaron turn to God with the problem, and he tells them to call the people together. He instructs Moses to speak to the rock that stands before them, and water will come forth. But Moses' patience with the Israelites has finally worn out. He turns on the people and cries out, Listen, you rebels, must we bring you water out of this rock? He then raised his arm and struck the rock twice with his staff. Water gushed forth so that the people and their animals had more than enough to drink. What, you might ask, has he done wrong? Two things, apparently. First, the Lord had told him simply to speak to the rock, not strike it. And second, Moses had made it sound as though he and Aaron were responsible for this miracle. Must we bring forth water from this rock? When actually, we had nothing at all to do with it. It's God who has graciously, miraculously provided. It seems that this twofold error, striking the rock in anger instead of merely speaking to it, and making it sound as though he and his brother were the agents of the miracle, brought down the wrath of God. The Lord tells Moses and Aaron, because you did not trust in me enough to honor me as holy in the sight of the Israelites, you will not bring this community into the land I give them. You'll remember that when Moses originally met God at the burning bush, the Lord's first lesson to him was about holiness. Take off your shoes, for the place where you are standing is holy ground. God is set apart from us by his utter holiness, lest we forget it. And Moses almost always bore that in mind. But this one lapse cost him dearly. And that brings me back to Michelangelo and his 40 years in the wilderness. The tomb he proposed to build for Julius II would have been the greatest, most challenging work of a lifetime, the largest monument of its kind created since antiquity or possibly ever. The work he had done in his early 20s had already secured his reputation as a brilliant sculptor. He had completed the Pietà in 1499 and the Statue of David in 1504. Both works had caused an immediate sensation, and his reputation for making marble seem to come alive was the reason Julius asked him to design his tomb. The minute Michelangelo secured the contract for the tomb in 1505, he set out for Carrara, where he spent nine months selecting, quarrying, and arranging for the transport of some 100 tons of marble back to Rome. However, while Michelangelo was away, it is said that two of his rivals, the architect Donato Bramante and the rising young star Raphael Sanzio, probably out of jealousy for Michelangelo's huge commission, convinced Julius that it was unlucky to build one's tomb during one's own lifetime. So, when Michelangelo returned to Rome, seeking reimbursement for the money he had laid out for the purchase and transport of 100 tons of the finest marble, Julius refused to see him. This went on for some time, until Michelangelo finally left Rome and returned to Florence in high dudgeon. Meanwhile, Julius, as depicted here by Raphael, went off to fight expensive wars to regain land formerly belonging to the Papal States. He was known as the Warrior Pope, 
and had named himself Julius after his hero, Julius Caesar. When he returned to Rome, he devoted himself to the extraordinarily expensive project of rebuilding St. Peter's Basilica from the ground up under Bramante's direction. When Michelangelo was finally convinced to come back to Rome after a vigorous campaign of flattery and threats, he was told that there simply wasn't enough money at the present time to proceed with the work on the tomb. But Bramante and Raphael were whispering in Julius's ear that he should have Michelangelo do all the fresco work for the new, improved Sistine Chapel ceiling. What they secretly hoped was that Michelangelo would fail spectacularly at this task and leave Rome entirely. He was a sculptor after all, not a painter, and painting frescoes on the very curvy and complicated spaces of that towering ceiling would challenge the talents of even the finest artist skilled in painting frescoes. However, to the amazement of his rivals, Michelangelo finally accepted the task. This was in 1508. And you know the rest of that story. After getting off to a bad start, trying to get used to the difficult technique of painting frescoes, something entirely new to him, and after painstakingly designing a purpose-built movable scaffolding system that would allow him to paint directly under the ceiling, Michelangelo, you might say, got the hang of it. As you know, the Sistine Chapel ceiling is one of the greatest artistic achievements in the world. We can move in a bit closer to appreciate it. It's absolutely stunning. It takes your breath away, especially since its restoration. And if we turn it on its side, we can read the story of creation from the bottom up in the red triangle, excuse me, rectangle. God separating light from darkness on the bottom, then creating the sun and the moon, then the plants and animals, up through the creation of Adam and Eve, followed by the sin in the Garden of Eden, the drunkenness of Noah, and finally to the flood at the top. It took him four years, and in 1512, he was eager to start back to work on the tomb. Between 1512 and 1516, he completed three sculptures for the project. These two slaves, each about seven and a half feet tall, are now in the Louvre, the dying or sleeping slave on the left and the rebellious slave on the right. They were meant to be part of the tomb's original design. Wherever you see a red dot, a slave was to stand above it all the way around the tomb. This was supposed to signify that all of the arts were bound, held captive at the death of the great art patron, Julius II. The third sculpture completed during this time was our statue of Moses. Before we go any further, I have to answer the question that might have already formed in your minds. Why did Michelangelo depict Moses with horns. This is actually due to a mistranslation from the Hebrew Bible into the Vulgate or Latin translation. Scripture says that whenever Moses met with God at the tent of meeting, he emerged from these sessions with a radiant countenance. His face glowed. The translators thought the Hebrew word meant that actual horns were coming out of his head instead of an aura of brightness. And for centuries after, Moses was conventionally depicted with horns until the error was finally cleared up. So don't be surprised if you see Moses with horns in works of art from that time. It was all a misunderstanding due to a brat bad translation. It wasn't a slur on Moses's character. Unfortunately, Julius II died in February of 1513. 
he lived just long enough to see the grand unveiling of the Sistine Chapel ceiling on November the 1st, 1512. As he approached death, he had second thoughts about the size and expense of his tomb, especially since the work on St. Peter's was racking up enormous bills, all financed by the dubious practice of selling indulgences. Julius decided that the tomb should not be freestanding, but be built into a wall on one side. That would eliminate some of the expense and reduce the amount of sculpting necessary. Upon his death, neither his heirs nor the executors of his estate were eager to pay vast sums for a design that was still grandiose. In addition, the family of which Julius was a part, the Della Rovere family, was rapidly ceding power to the Medici family, whose rise would continue for years to come and would yield two Medici popes within Michelangelo's lifetime. They saw no point in glorifying a rival family with a monumental tomb in St. Peter's, where they now ruled. The design was subsequently downsized. It would now be built into the wall, something along the lines of what we see here. Still grandiose, still three tiers, but with a much reduced number of major figures. As time went by, there was less and less enthusiasm for the project. With each redrawing of the contract, the design grew smaller, less ambitious. Sometime in the 1520s, Michelangelo began work on the four unfinished slaves that you can see in the Accademia in Florence. You will pass them as you go down the hall to look at the statue of David. They are unfinished, still trying to break free of the stone. Because in the final designs agreed upon for the, stone, for the tomb, there was no longer a place for them. The final details for the wall tomb were drawn up with Julius's grandson in 1542. They would include the figure of Moses, now given pride of place, as well as the figures of Rachel and Leah. None of the rest of the work would be done by Michelangelo, would be done by assistants. And when the tomb was finally installed in San Pietro in Vincoli in 1545, minus the body of Julius, which occupied a humble berth in St. Peter's, it was a far cry from the glorious vision Michelangelo had imagined 40 years before. In two weeks' time, we'll examine the statue of Moses in greater detail, because even though the project it's a part of is nothing like what Michelangelo dreamed it would be, this statue is rightly regarded as one of his greatest masterpieces. We'll do that in two weeks because the scripture in two weeks has not lent itself to artistic representation. So that will allow me to finish up this study of Moses and Michelangelo. Next week, we'll be looking at how the Israelites very quickly violated the first commandment that we read about today and decided to worship a golden calf. Until then, stay safe, be blessed, and I'll see you next week.